Hello, and thank you for exploring Lakehead International's videos. My name is Jordan, and I am the International New and Social Media Officer. I'm also the host of the Lakehead International Live series, a fun and informative way for you to connect with current international students, professors, and ask questions about admissions and everything Lakehead. You are about to watch a recording from one of our previous live sessions. If any questions arise throughout the video, please do not hesitate to comment below. If you would like to check out some of our upcoming live sessions, please head over to our website at lakeheadu.ca forward slash international dash live. Let's begin. Hello folks and welcome to another Lakehead International Live. My name is Jordan Ball. I'll be your host today. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your patience. I do apologize for our delay to the start of our International Lecture Showcase today. We had a bit of technical issues, but we are very excited to be joined by a special guest who I will introduce in just a moment. Once again, to our audience members, whether it's your morning, your afternoon, your evening, we hope you're ready to learn more about BioFuture here at Lakehead University and get a little taste for what it's like being a student with this sample lecture. Once again, my name is Jordan Ball. I'm the International new, uh, new and Social Media Officer. I help run our live events, our digital experiences, our social media channels, as well as the Global Ambassador Program. Pass over to my colleague Patrick to introduce himself, and then we will segue into our special guest on today's session. Good morning, Jordan, and, and like you said, good afternoon and good evening to all of our, our uh, students joining us today. My name is Patrick Carr. I am uh, one of the international recruitment officers here at Lakehead University. I normally work with students out of the Middle East, Africa, as well as the Caribbean, but I am happy to be here this morning to answer any questions behind the scenes on behalf of all of my colleagues based around the globe. Uh, and with that, Jordan, thank you for having me. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And I have the distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Janusz Kaczynski, the Dean of Engineering, who is going to be doing a international lecture showcase for us today. So I'll pass over to him. Uh, it is wonderful to um, spend this morning with you. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, what's for us in the future with regards to new forms of energy, clean energy, but also being a dean uh, and knowing that some of you are potential students or incoming students, I wanted to share with you a few things about who we are as the engineering faculty here at Lakehead. So look, before we begin, let me start with uh, a life advice of sorts or, a, or a, a guiding principle. There's a proverb that says that if you want to go fast and travel alone, but if you want to go far in life, travel together. It's all about creating partnerships. It's as important in academic world uh, as it is in your personal and, um, and professional um, settings as, as well. Now, uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, how important it is of being, uh, uh, knowing yourself and being authentic and challenging, challenging yourself. I remember, now, well, this is me at the top of the CN Tower in Toronto. And uh, this is where I uh, was, when I was giving a, um, a speech to my students about uh, going outside of your comfort zone. So being authentic, I went up there and gave a speech from the top of, uh, of the CN Tower. And uh, perhaps next time when we have an opportunity to chat, I may, I may talk to you about uh, other forms of challenging my challenging yourself and especially myself when I went to space on a zero gravity flight or when I was diving with great white sharks in uh, uh, of uh, Cape Town in, in South Africa. Those are the things that engineers uh, do quite often. If you ask them, I'm sure they will have plenty of stories to share with you. Well, my story this morning is to talk to you about uh, clean energy. What can we do in order to generate and utilize clean energy? Now, before we do so, what's really important is to set the stage for it. You see, it's almost clear that using fossil fuels in the future, <clears throat> it's got to be um, diminished, it, uh, perhaps at some point eliminated. Why so? Because if you compare the uh, fossil fuel consumption with uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, those emissions that uh, affect the climate, they affect the global warming, that uh, has, they, they have significant 
um, geopolitical concerns about especially these days and they affect human beings and animals as well in a detrimental way way so if you if you take a look at uh, the consumption of fossil fuels such as in china or russia or uh, the united states or canada or india you can you can see that emissions are quite proportional to the consumption the same largest emissions that we the larger consumption that we were seeing on the left are correlated very well with uh, largest uh, emissions on the right now so if you look at the global percentage of uh, uh, countries that uh, contribute uh, to uh, um, uh, to greenhouse gas um, emissions, uh, the China and US and India and uh, Russian federations are, are um, contributing the most. Canada is also present there. We we produce a lot of fossil fuels, but luckily for us, uh, the uh, as a variety of governments, both provincial and federal governments, they decided to invest in green, clean energy. That in, and that those are the positive things that I really wanted to talk to you about uh, today. So there are a variety of options and variety of solutions. I will focus on two of them. So one is to use biomass as the uh, source of uh, clean energy and uh, hydrogen they are actually related interrelated biomass and and uh, hydrogen well why biomass you see you see if you um, when the biomass is growing and i explain in a moment what kind of biomass i have in mind when biomass is growing it's absorbing co2 from the atmosphere and then the when the biomass is being uh, changed into a biofuel and then being used and CO2 is being emitted and then again absorbed, uh, changed and emitted. So there is a cycle. Essentially, if you use biomass, then uh, you do not contribute, certainly no in significant way, to the emissions of CO2. Now, if biomass is being used to generate hydrogen, rather than biofuel, then there, there, the, the cycle stops here. There is no generation of CO2. So if we are able to find a way to uh, transform biomass directly into hydrogen, then we are essentially removing CO2 from the atmosphere. It's a very powerful method to do it. Now, um, there are almost everywhere where you look around, it is a biomass. Anything that is organic is biomass. So it could be residues from uh, wood industry or forestry, agricultural, uh, a variety of um, grasses, uh, residues from uh, wineries um, as well, or, or uh, pulp and paper industry, which is the using forest uh, products to generate a useful, um, uh, useful things. Now, so. This is a biomass. It's uh, abundantly available. It is not expensive um, and it is available always uh, uh, around the year. So you have, we have always a proper feedstock that we can use in order to generate, um, generate a variety of things. If you look at the, what you can use um, the biomass, especially lignocellulosic biomass for, you can use it for biofuels. You can generate uh, activated carbon that uh, cleans water. You can generate uh, a variety of um, um, biocomposites or uh, um, hydrogels or fabrics that you can use in fashion industry. So there is a um, uh, the, there is a plenty of opportunities for us to utilize biomass in a variety of ways. Now the way that uh, uh, we believe that is one of the most efficient and effective is to use water, supercritical water, to treat biomass. Now, uh, th this is just a pressure temperature diagram. So if you, if we think about water, there are 
a different faces of water. It could be ice. We have plenty of it in Canada um, at some point of, of the year. It could be a, simply a liquid water. You can, you can heat it up and generate steam, um, the water vapor out of it. But there is a point called the critical point that above that point, we, gen we, we um, have supercritical water. So it's neither liquid nor gas. It, it's in the supercritical stage. That critical point is at 374 degrees C and around 218 atmospheres. So it's relatively high pressure. But above that point, water behaves in a completely different way. It's perhaps the best solvent in the world there, there is. So if you have just a piece of paper, say, which is a predominantly organic material, if you put it in supercritical water, it would dissolve in just a few milliseconds to um, individual atoms. So what, uh, what we utilize with supercritical water, we, we uh, utilize this homogeneous medium to run a variety of um, reactions, oxidation, gasification, dehydrogenation. What we do, is we use uh, water as both a reactant and catalyst. And importantly, the supercritical water is capable of creating a variety of uh, uh, chemical substances, such as uh, free radicals, that are very effective in, uh, in creating green clean fuels that we are interested in. So, uh, well, there are many different ways of using um, the, uh, uh, of applying supercritical water. It could be in a batch reactor. It could be in a continuous flow reactor. It could be uh, in a large pyrolysis system, or it could be in generating uh, a biochar system. It, we use quite often a very interesting tool, which was developed by NASA in the United States to um, uh, apply supercritical water under zero gravity conditions, actually, at an international space station. So um, the beauty of this approach is that you may have a variety of uh, tools to utilize the same medium to generate a variety of clean fuels. Now, this is called a uh, clean biorefining process. And uh, I'm uh, absolutely delighted to share with you that we have a biorefining research institute here at Lakehead. It's one of the very best places to do this kind of research in the world. So if you come to Lakehead, we'll be delighted to take you on a tour of uh, Biorefining Research Institute and um, share with you what they do. The current uh, executive director of the Institute is one of our professors from, from engineering. Now, so what do we do? We would uh, take a variety of uh, bio waste. It could be, in this case, could be uh, uh, the waste from uh, food industry. So you can take residues, either orange peels or, or lemon or banana. What you do is you put it all in the reactor, you uh, change temperature, pressure, you change the, the concentration of these uh, materials that go to uh, the reactor and you change the time. So you play essentially with uh, those um, four elements or parameters, we call it, and uh, you uh, can generate any combination of uh, gases that you can see here. Well, our purpose actually is to predominantly focus on hydrogen or the combination of hydrogen and carbon monoxide, which is called a synthetic gas, plenty of clean applications. However, in some instances, we can also generate uh, methane, which, which is a main product of natural gas. Um, and in some cases, if necessary, we can generate CO2. For example, if we want to um, re retrieve uh, oil from underground, uh, the CO2 is a very good, uh, um, very good way to, to deal with it. So uh, look, I, I don't want to overload you too much with uh, chem neither chemistry nor equations, especially on a Tuesday morning, but, uh, but I wanted to 
to show you what's behind it. In order to understand the processes, you have to use a lot of advanced analytical techniques. In this case, it is spectroscopy that we were using. And then understand the behavior of uh, biomass uh, during those reactions. So we initially, what's happening is we hydrolyze biomass to obtain a variety of chemicals, in predominantly organic acids. And then there is a catalytic process that leads to creating alcohols and phenols and, and um, the, a variety of aromatics, which is very easy then to gasify in supercritical water. Um, and that's, those are the products, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, or in our case, predominantly we focus on hydrogen. However, if you really want to um, expand these uh, reactions, you can, uh, you can uh, use a variety of uh, methanation techniques and get CH4 plus H2, or you can provide for a water shift reaction and get uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So uh, the beauty of this approach is uh, that you have plenty of flexibility. That's what you want to do in any type of uh, scientific or engineering research, you want to have a variety of parameters to play with and you want to have a variety of flexibilities to either stop the process at some point or uh, to branch it out to whatever outcome you'd like to have. So that is the processing of biomass. So biomass is a very, uh, a very good option as uh, fuel. However, many of us believe that hydrogen is the uh, fuel of the future. Well, why so? Because it's, uh, it exists in abundance uh, and in, 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 uh, in universe. So if there is a way for us to extract it in an efficient way and then generate clean green hydrogen, that is the pathway for us to uh, proceed. So we, well, why so? Because um, hydrogen, if you look at the heating value of the hydrogen, it's around five times more than um, ethanol. It's about three times higher than gasoline and about 2.5 times higher than natural gas. So you can generate plenty um, of energy, clean energy using hydrogen. And when you utilize hydrogen in order to generate energy, which is that you combine it with oxygen, the only product of that process is H2O. So it's water or water vapors, very clean. And then you can, and then again, you can split it and generate hydrogen or oxygen so, and then link it up again up in order to generate energy. So it is, uh, you can do it in, in principle, in perpetuity. There are many different ways of uh, processing hydrogen, such as gasification or dehydrogenation, steam reforming, electrolysis or electrocatalysis. Uh, everything depends how um, quickly you would like to have uh, that process completed and what are the uh, outcomes of, uh, of, the, of, of the, uh, the process. Well, and you may ask a question, why is it that the hydrogen is not being used as yet um, as the predominant fuel um, because it is the cleanest fuel that you can, um, that you, you, you can obtain at this time? Um, well, the, problem, <clears throat> the problems that are predominantly linked with hydrogen are related to safety uh, um, and particularly storing the hydrogen is expensive and it is not safe. You perhaps uh, remember uh, back, I think it was in 1986, the Challenger disaster, uh, where essentially what we had is the leak of hydrogen and leak of oxygen in, from separate tanks that created a, uh, a bomb, as essentially. This, so that is uh, a problem that we have to overcome. That's why the best way to deal with generating uh, clean hydrogen is to do so, um, uh, uh, is to generate it on demand or just in time or just in case. So we can utilize right away what we generate and uh, 
the supercritical water approach is one of those processes that allows you uh, to do so. Well, again, the word is flexibility. So the countries that generate hydrogen the most are the United States and South Korea and, and Japan. Um, you know, some countries like Germany, they decided to focus on other forms of energy, predominantly renewables, and wind, and solar, and so on. That's why the hydrogen generation is dropping. Canada is, is maintaining uh, our um, generation. And actually, uh, the latest uh, um, the government focus on uh, hydrogen, which is the governmental hydrogen strategy, will bring us uh, more or less at the level of Japan within just a few years. So indeed, hydrogen is being generated across uh, around the world. And what's really important is to make certain that it is generated in a way that is not producing any uh, byproducts that could be considered hazardous. Now, um, there are many different ways to deal with, with, with it. One uh, way in the lab, you. You can use, we, we use a diamond anvil cell. So this is uh, around uh, uh, 15 centimeters in uh, height and around uh, 10 centimeters across. So uh, those of you who play hockey, if you just put two hockey packs together, that's the diamond anvil cell. And inside that cell, it is a reaction chamber. So this is a reaction chamber here, uh, two diamonds squeezing the water in between to generate supercritical conditions. Now those time, the, the chamber is around 500 microns in diameter and around 200 microns in depth, very small. You put it under the microscope and you see, you run reactions and you see what is happening and you measure what is happening, very powerful tool. The other tool is, I mentioned uh, the uh, uh, supercritical water reactor that uh, was developed by NASA to study what's happening at the zero gravity that was uh, that was donated to um, our university and we will be doing a lot of research with uh, these uh, with this reactor and involving a lot of both undergraduate and graduate students in those research uh, researches uh, and we can uh, do a, 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 a processing on a very large scale at the Canadian light source synchrotron. Synchrotrons are uh, the terrific uh, the terrific uh, research tools. They are extremely expensive. But on the other hand, you can do the variety of uh, measurements at the same time on the same sample. There is nothing more powerful with regards to this kind of research than uh, synchrotron. The, 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 because they are very expensive, there are typically only one or two in every country. In Canada, there is one synchrotron uh, located in, uh, in Saskatoon. If you, if you are in Saskatoon, I would always recommend you to take a look. It's massive, but it's also beautiful uh, for those of you who like science and engineering. Now, so what is happening? It's uh, when we process a biomass in those devices like uh, diamond anvil cell that I mentioned or in the device from NASA. So we have, have a biomass and when you process biomass, then uh, it will ultimately at the end, it will be completely processed to something different. Now, during that time, a variety of chemicals will evolve. So for example, initially, there is a, a hydrocarbon, an aromatic hydrocarbon called phenantrin. There's, we, you don't want to have phenantrin anywhere because it is a mutagenic and cancerogenic substance. So it's good that in our processing, we are able to complete it, uh, to uh, um, the decompose it. Then there are many different acids or uh, the, just uh, from the acid there you're going to have acetylene, C2H2. But the beauty of the process is that at the very end, what you end up with is uh, hydrogen. So that's, that's the uh, wonderful uh, thing to have. And well, it is a green hydrogen. So I wanted to highlight it. Well, I wanted to highlight it also by wearing a green tie today to uh, 
underline the uh, approach that uh, we have with regards to uh, green fuels. So let me uh, offer a few observations. And then I spend just a few minutes at, at the end to tell you a little bit more about who we are as engineering. So we, we indeed, the, bio, the future and the biofuture, we believe it's going to be around uh, uh, biomass, around green hydrogen. There are some other processes that we can discuss it during our um, the questions and um, uh, the question period. Uh, but uh, what's really important is also linking it with uh, a broader concept of biorefinery, because in addition to clean fuels, clean energy, we can generate uh, materials a variety of products that can be used in everyday life. The beauty of the supercritical water application is that you can uh, uh, you can process a variety of materials, and you uh, there is a similar behavior of those different materials that you have, and at the same time, the reactions that are taking place are. Uh, really fast, and uh, they take place in parallel rather than in sequential manner that is at uh, um, taking place at uh, different, uh, using different types of technologies. The problem at the moment, the main problem with this kind of approach is scaling it up because of the highly corrosive environment that uh, supercritical water creates. I mentioned safety. And uh, there is uh, very complex uh, kinetics and thermodynamics that we don't understand as yet. So that's, well, I think it's a good thing for those of you who are interested in research, the next uh, wave, next generation of young researchers, that's the area that you may want to um, study. In our case, for us, the next stage is to uh, apply supercritical water approach at uh, zero gravity. So that is something that we, we believe that is relevant and it will be really cool from uh, the research perspective as well. Now, uh, look, so th those, this, that's the general approach that I wanted to sh share with you what's happening in the world, but specifically also what we do here at, uh, um, at Lakehead. So let me give you an, an example for those of you who are really interested in uh, um, uh, a variety of discoveries and uh, types of research that you may do, you have to always think big. You should never diminish your, uh, your own creativity or, 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 or limit yourself from the outset. However, you have to start small and you, because you have to show to yourself, to your friends, uh, to other people that you are able to achieve results. So uh, starting small makes absolutely um, perfect sense. Now, there are many other things that you may be interested um, in conducting research about, not only uh, green fuel or, or uh, clean energy and so on, um, Internet of Things, big data, on, or, on th those are the things that are artificial intelligence. Those are the mega trends that are taking place in uh, um, uh, um, around the world uh, and conducting research at different universities. We do conduct research uh, on those topics here at Lakehead as well. Uh, actually, we are perhaps the most advanced, uh, the we have a most advanced research group in the country with regards to blockchain. That is uh, the principle that very likely are going to uh, change the way how we live. Now, it's also important to link those mega trends with the types of skills that uh, the next wave of students, next wave of researchers, next wave of scientists and engineers have to have, such as uh, cognitive flexibility, creativity. Um, th those are the elements that we instill in our students here at Lakehead as well. Well, why so? Because uh, uh, the learning that is taking place right now is very different than uh, uh, what was happening in the past. I, I, if I look at my father, who is a, a teacher in, in, in a uh, high school, he started as a teacher and it was a job for life. He's 
is still enjoying it very much. Um, uh, people like me, we, we, we have, uh, rather than having a job for life, we have a career for life. So we stay, say, in academia, we change the way how we operate, we change the way how we research, we change the way how we teach, but we are still uh, more or less operating within the same milieu. This is you guys, you meaning all those young uh, colleagues and students who joined us this morning. You are going to have a variety of careers in your life. And that's why it's absolutely critical to make certain that we're going to develop the way of uh, um, teaching you and for you to learn that will prepare you for this new reality. So what we really need to do is to make sure that our education is like you, creative, changing, colorful, and so on. And that's exactly what we are doing uh, here at Lakehead in, uh, in the Faculty of Engineering, because we do realize that in what we really need is people who can create in a collaborative way, who will consider a variety of consequences uh, for humans um, uh, and for the world prior to designing something. And uh, people that have very good skills to communicate complexity to the, uh, the rest of us. Now, that is why at Lakehead, what we had done is we created a, a few new programs. We modernized the existing programs that we have um, in the Faculty of Engineering. And if you are interested in uh, joining us, please let us know. We'll be absolutely delighted to share with you what is it that we're doing? And most importantly, what are the things that we have in store for you, both in our campus in Thunder Bay and in Barry and in Aurelia? Um, uh, the, that's the message that I wanted to uh, share with you this morning. Now, I understand that, uh, and I noticed that you have some questions. So perhaps it is a good time for us to uh, stop the presentation and switch to questions and uh, answers. Thank you so very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to share uh, my observations, and my ideas, and ideas of my colleagues with you this morning. Thank you once again. Jordan. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. That was highly intriguing. And I appreciate your uh, your reference to some uh, common terms. I'm, I'm more familiar with hockey pucks than I am about science in general. I'm a business major, but I find that highly fascinating. I'm excited to see some of those questions rolling in, as you mentioned. So we'll dive right into them and, and I'll pass them over to you. First and foremost, we have a couple questions from Pierre. The first one says, do you think nuclear energy is viable, clean, uh, complement to biomass to get hydrogen? Uh, the, the answer is I do. Actually, uh, the, my research team and I, we, we, we work on uh, uh, the next generation, Gen 4, Generation 4 of nuclear reactors. Those are the reactors that actually are going to utilize supercritical water as the cooling agent. So uh, uh, look, uh, like anything, um, in life, the key is to find a healthy balance. I believe there is uh, a variety of ways to provide uh, energy in order to sustain life on the earth. And ultimately, the universe and likely on, on, uh, on Mars, per perhaps. Um, uh, well, why so uh, about nuclear energy? Because the truth is that the nuclear if you generate energy via nuclear reactors, you do not um, emit any of those greenhouse gases that we do when we utilize fossil fuels. Now, indeed, the main uh, uh, problem with, uh, there are two main problems with nuclear energy. So one is that we generate uh, radioactive waste and we have to deal with it. Um, there are well, we are applying, um, I should mention that we are applying supercritical water treatment to deal with low radioactive waste, and it's working quite all right. Now, uh, the other problem, of course, is uh, uh, public perception, and uh, nobody wants to have a nuclear reactor in one's uh, backyard. But uh, 
uh, well, um, it is our perception of nuclear energy was to a, some degree what was defined by what had happened at Chernobyl long time ago. Uh, but our the approach right now is completely different. It's, uh, for example, France generates around 80 plus percent of their electricity via nuclear reactors. And now, but what they do is they do so by um, uh, building many small reactors rather than a, a mammoth type of reactor like it was at uh, Chernobyl. So if you have a small reactor, if you have a problem related to, to it, it's a small problem that, it, that one can fix. Um, uh, so that's perhaps uh, uh, the approach uh, with regards to the future of uh, nuclear energy. Well, the other uh, the the other approach is to uh, generate to to build a new types of reaction reactors rather than those that utilize uranium and then uh, produce plutonium that is weapon grade plutonium. The other approach is to use thorium. Thorium is a very a good way to um, utilize uh, in uh, those the next generation of nuclear reactors. So yes, the answer is there is a role for nuclear energy in the clean energy mix in the future. Awesome, good to know. And, and another question from Pierre, and I, I had a very similar question. He phrased it better than I did, so I'll pass it. I'll give him the credit. It says, I assume cars would need to be adapted to hydrogen models. Are there alternative methods of distributions of hydrogen batteries that can be safe and clean? I know that you touched on the fact that right now it's, it's considered highly dangerous and you referenced uh, the Challenger explosion for NASA's uh, mission back in the 80s. Uh, so I'm also curious, how do you make a, um, a safe model and, and what does that entail? Well, um, look, we moved uh, <clears throat> a long way since uh, 1986 when the, the Challenger disaster had happened. <clears throat> and uh, uh, hydrogen storage, it's much, much more safe right now. There are many different ways to do so. Um, for example, in um, um, using a variety of um, hydroxides. Uh, hydroxides would uh, combine hydrogen um, in a safe and stable way, and then it would be relatively easy to extract hydrogen from um, these kinds of uh, settings. Now, um, but I also should mention that uh, in addition to hydrogen and in addition to uh, um, nuclear that we mentioned. There was also a question about a variety of other renewable energy, such as solar and wind energy, and how we can manage uh, those energies and how we do manage them in, at Lakehead University. Europe is the in the forefront of uh, applying um, a variety of renewables, including solar and wind, to generate um, energy. It, it is um, uh, it, it is still at the uh, level of initial applications because the what you really want to do in order to uh, generate, for example, electricity, clean electricity, you have to have, uh, you have to make certain that it is being uh, delivered, generated, and delivered on a continuous basis. And at the moment, uh, the solar energy technologies and wind energy technologies. Uh, um, are struggling um, with uh, this kind of, of approach. I have no doubt whatsoever that it will evolve and it will improve and it will certainly um, be applicable to a variety of places, especially somewhat uh, remote places that we have uh, here in, uh, in Canada. As for our university, I know that uh, there is a, uh, an, a clear drive towards uh, utilizing um, ever cleaner uh, approach to generating energy. And uh, indeed, uh, well, if I'm in my office right now looking outside and I can see the next building to where we are with uh, several different um, solar batteries, um, those are at the moment used predominantly for research, although one of the buildings is being um, heated by uh, those solar batteries. So the, 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 it will 
only involve and improve. Um, the key will be to find the type of technology that is economically feasible. At the moment, the majority of those technologies are subsidized by a variety of local or provincial or federal governments, uh, which is great because it helps to develop those technologies. But the future is uh, in the uh, well-balanced approach that does involve renewables, does involve hydrogen, biomass, does involve as well uh, nuclear. And, and it's inevitable that in many countries around the world, fossil fuel is still going to be used. We you hear on TV quite often that Europe is trying to uh, reduce their dependence on uh, gas and, and oil and coal. And, and uh, I believe that uh, they, they are going to succeed. Yes, there is a tremendous desire, public desire, to make it happen. And this is exactly what the new generation, uh, young people, this is exactly what you should be doing. You, sh you should uh, never hesitate to, to, to tell your representatives in the government or your friends or your professors how passionate you are about the future of clean, green energy that we have to generate and we have to have um, uh, in the world. Awesome. On the heels of your note of sort of the efforts Lakehead has been putting in, I do want to share with the audience some really exciting news that was just released uh, early or, or late last week, pardon me. Uh, the Times Higher Education actually does a, a, a global ranking for over 1,500 universities around the world uh, and, and in terms of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so there are 17 categories. Lakehead University for three consecutive years has been in the top 100, um, but the top 100 this year for us essentially got smaller. We are now 64th in the world out of those 1500 universities. So that means that we're in the top 5%. And for three of those categories, uh, life below water, life on land, and no poverty. Lakehead University is the top 25 globally. And so that's some really, really incredible uh, impact that we're having on those UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that connects to sort of our own efforts to make and create change here at Lakehead University. Um, but I don't want to steal your thunder, Janos. I'm going to pass back to you with a few more questions while we have you. Uh, this one says, is there a concern oh, about ahead. depleting water sources around the world and the use of supercritical water to generate energy? Uh, yeah, so I respond to the question um, in, in just a moment because you mentioned rankings. and. Uh, uh, look, we are very, we are very proud when we saw the uh, Lakehead doing so very well in this kind of ranking. That is very, very important. Now, last uh, last November there was another ranking that was released by Times Higher Education, which is an independent publication in London, uh, England, uh, uh, and uh, in that ranking, Lakehead Engineering was lang ranked number one in Canada for the um, undergraduate for the quality of undergraduate uh, engineering programs among uh, the universities that focus predominantly on um, undergraduate education i mean that is a very important element because to undergraduate students what really matters is to uh, is is the quality of of their undergraduate education that 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 is uh, something that uh, that we are absolutely proud of, as we are, of being in the top 100 ranking with regards to uh, environmental impact, uh, environmental impact in a positive way. <laughs> yes. Now, so uh, then I, I answered, the, 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 there was also another question about uh, electric vehicles, at, uh, the, uh, particularly the future of electric vehicles and considering significant investments of uh, both federal and provincial government in Canada in uh, um, the electrical vehicle um, industry. And I, I believe it is a, a very good investment because electric vehicles, they are already, um, uh, they are already uh, available uh, quite widely in a variety of countries, certainly in our country as well. Uh, however, I, I tend to believe that uh, 
perhaps the ultimate type of a really clean vehicle, it will be the vehicle that will be powered by hydrogen. Um, be, be, because that's the ultimate way that uh, we will be able to prevent any sort of uh, um, uh, waste, uh, any sort of, uh, of the uh, detrimental effect on the environment in the, with electrical electric vehicle, there is some effect on the environment because there are, we have to generate electricity somehow. And then what we have to do is we have to recharge batteries and, 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 and so on. Nevertheless, it's a terrific uh, trajectory towards the future that uh, very likely will be dominated by uh, vehicles that will be run on hydrogen, maybe even on supercritical water. We'll see how uh, that goes. Now, it is true that there was one question about, uh, um, I think it was something related to biomass and especially that if you decide to grow biomass on the land that could be used to grow uh, um, uh, crops that are necessary to sustain life in a variety of parts of the world. Now, so uh, we are, uh, when we talk about biomass, we're not talking about uh, uh, the competition between uh, crops for food and uh, crops for energy. We are using predominantly a biomass that is a bio waste from uh, um, those industries such as agriculture, such as uh, forestry or winery and so on. So there is no direct competition with regards to that. And about, uh, <clears throat> about water, well, uh, water, um, the, in order to process uh, I don't know, around uh, one ton of bio waste, what we need is just uh, uh, a fraction of that amount of, of water. So, so again, I understand uh, the concern that water indeed is the com commodity. It's an, it is a very important commodity um, that we uh, have to cherish. And we are very lucky in our country that we have so much of fresh water uh, available, but we have enough water that is um, necessary to sustain life and enough water to use in order to <clears throat> apply um, the supercritical water treatment. So there is no worry with regards to that whatsoever. Awesome. <clears throat> Were there any questions in the Q&A there that you saw that you wanted to specifically address, or would you like me to pick another one at random? Um, the, well, there, 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 is, there was a question uh, about, uh, the, there are a few comments, actually, that pe people thank me for the uh, lecture. I, I, I actually, look, I, I should be the one that should be thanking you for finding the time and um, attending this morning, morning lecture. But I have to say that this is something that uh, my colleagues and I, that's what we do at Likert in engineering. Uh, I like to meet with uh, my students uh, quite often, either in my office or in other places. Now that uh, they are not as significant or restrictive or the restrictions with regards to masks, then we can actually, in addition to meeting, we can see one another from a little bit of a distance, I should say. Um, so, uh, um, and we do have um, a variety of debates and conversations and discussions um, about uh, not only the, the future of uh, energy or the, not only about the future of education, but about everyday, um, everyday life. This is that's the approach that we have. We do create an environment that is family-like, and we can do so because we we are not a big size type of a university. We are we are the university that has the optimal size. And I I speak from uh, experience. I was a professor previously at the university with almost sixty thousand students. I mean, it's impossible to uh, get to know one another whatsoever. And in my own faculty, I, I know uh, many of my students uh, by first name. So uh, that's the kind of approach that uh, the collegial 
and family-like approach that we uh, that we promote here. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for your time. I know you're appreciative of our, of our audience as we are as well, whether it was your morning, your afternoon, your night, um, joining us and, and sharing all your questions with us, but also to Dr. Kozinski, that was a beautiful lecture to say the least, very interesting. And I'm excited to see where uh, you take that lecture, that topic, that, that idea of hydrogen and, and biomass energy with Lakehead and, and the future of our students. Thank you for checking out today's video. If you have any questions, you can always comment below. Stay connected and follow us on our social media channels to stay informed about upcoming webinars and get an insider sneak peek of Lakehead University. See you next time.